On this podcast, you'll find interviews with high-performing, successful individuals in life sciences. On a weekly basis, we cover their proven methods, principles, strategies, and mindsets to implement new technologies that scale to meet the needs of people in our world. Welcome to the Life Science Success Podcast. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Don Davis. I'm a consultant in life sciences. I help companies manage complexity and increase performance. Today on the podcast, we have Emmanuel or Martin Emanuel Bittner, and uh, we're going to be talking about his company. But uh, before we hop into that, I wanted to uh, just quickly mention on my website, on my consulting uh, website, 5280 Life Sciences, uh, we have a organizational maturity assessment. It's built for organizations who are looking to scale. So if you're looking to add people currently inside of your organization and wonder why it is that your efficiency and the overall organization continues to slow down, this uh, maturity assessment will help to indicate a couple of different things that you can do uh, that will actually improve your performance over time. And so uh, with that, let me bring in our guest. And so Martin Emanuel Bittner, uh, he is the, the CEO and founder of Actoris, a biotech platform company powered by robotics and machine learning based in Oxford and Boston. So with that, welcome. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Yeah, thanks so much. So could you tell the listeners just a little bit about yourself? Yeah, of course. Very happy to. So very brief background. I qualified as a medical doctor in Germany, spent some time in oncology, but then decided I actually wanted to gain some more experience in research. So I came to the UK, came to Oxford, did my PhD as a Rose Scholar in early stage cancer drug discovery, which was a fascinating experience, but also showed me very clearly that the way we currently approach drug discovery is really a way which has not evolved much in a very long time. And right now we're seeing so many industries around us being transformed with the use of automation, robotics, the cloud, that I felt there was a very real opportunity to leverage these technologies in a drug discovery context. At the time, I met my co-founder, and for the past five years, we've now been building Arcturus. Oh, very good. And what is the name Arcturus? Hmm. Where does so it come the name from? Comes from? The name comes from a star constellation, and at the same time, it's also kind of a word which does not have any set meanings in any languages and kind of that none that we that we knew so it's always good to pick something something neutral and as you know in our industry picking something latin or greek is always a safe bet <laughs> very good yeah thanks so much for for sharing that I, whenever i looked i was like well it'll be interesting to have you have you explain that um <laughs> so what what led you overall to your career in life sciences you see how did i what led you to your career in life sciences? So I think the starting point on the clinical side, it's a wonderful profession to have when you can work directly with people in need and you can do something which has a very immediate impact on them, hopefully either kind of in oncology overcoming cancer, or at least if they do have to live with cancer to alleviate pain, improve quality of life. So that has been a very clear motivation for me and still is a very clear motivation. The, the one issue enough that I saw with working clinically is that unfortunately you can only ever treat one patient at a time. Mm. The impact you have will always be limited by how much time you personally can spend with patients. And that is the amazing thing about research, because if you work in drug discovery and you can help find just a single new antibody, a single new small molecule drug, you can have a tremendous impact on people around the world who can then hopefully lead longer, better and healthier lives. Uh, very good. And then, um, you know, what did you touched on this just a little bit? What uh, led you to found Arcturus? So I think the, the starting motivation really has been to experience myself in the laboratory, how much time researchers spend manually performing experiments. Of course, when you first step into the lab, you might have this rather kind of romantic notion that as a life scientist, you would spend your time reading papers, thinking through hypotheses, understanding molecular pathways, and then deciding which experiment to conduct. But the reality is that all of that intellectually stimulating 
an extremely important part of genuine critical scientific thinking does not get as much time as it should because you're so busy running cell culture, Western blotting, PCR, whichever other experiment you might have at your hands. And at the very same time, it's not just about how many hours are being spent doing these experiments, but also the very sad fact that a lot of the research being done mm -hmm. sadly comes overall with a data quality which is not sufficient, which is not appropriately well defined for applications in drug discovery, especially in machine learning driven drug discovery, where data quality can, becomes even more important. So in other words, there was a mix of a work mode, which felt out of sync with what researchers should be doing and should spend their time with. And there was the realization that we, as an industry, we genuinely have to think harder about how can we improve data quality and thereby also the predictive capacity of the experiments we conduct. So that is kind of how how the thinking started into which technologies should we leverage to allow us to improve on these two, these two very distinct issues. And then where does the company stand today? What, what, what are you act, where are you actually at? And, you know, do you have clients or customers today? Hmm. So throughout the past five years, the company has grown from two PhD students with an idea to now having a team of 35. The company still is primarily based in Oxford in the UK, but we just recently set up first early operations in the US as well, where we're actively hiring. So as a company, we spent the first two, two and a half years focusing entirely on technology development, on robotics development, on machine learning development, on the data science side and the software side, until we were confident that we had built a platform which would really deliver outstanding data quality, which goes beyond the state of the art. And since then, we've been moving to commercial operations. And by now we have partnerships with dozens of biotech and pharma companies in Europe, in North America, in Asia Pacific, from small virtual biotech companies, all the way to up to top 10 pharma companies using our platform and using our system to conduct their research. Okay. And then um, where, when normally in the life cycle of um, drug development do companies normally reach out or, or want to engage with your organization? Hmm. We're very much focused on the discovery stage. Mm -hmm. People would come to us, for example, with a novel target and they're excited about validating whether the target indeed plays a role, be it in oncology or in neuroscience or in diabetes or some other indication area. And from then onwards, we oftentimes take drug discovery programs through to hit ID and hit validation, hit to lead, and kind of then kind of throughout kind of the lead stage, sometimes even up to candidate stage. So it really is about having an end-to-end -end platform, which allows people to take their drugs from an initial idea to something which is ready for in vivo and then also clinical evaluation. Okay. And then um, what are some of the biggest challenges that you're facing right now? I mean, the stage right, right now means that we need as a highly, as a technologically highly sophisticated platform, we of course spend a lot of time making sure the technology works 100% of the time for all the experiments we conduct, for all of the projects kind of we, we embark on. That has been the primary focus for a long time. Now, the challenge we currently have is more towards how do we continue scaling, which means growing the scientific team, the platform, the business development team, and other support functions in sync. And that, of course, is an entirely different challenge because once technological challenges are more within the background, you have to think far more about operational efficiency, about different metrics you want to capture as a company. So this is kind of where we're currently at, making sure we can maintain our very high growth and kind of thereby also make sure we can serve more biotech and more pharma companies worldwide. Yeah. And what, I mean, do you have specific growth targets for um, the rest of this year in terms of the, the team growth and things like that, that you'd be willing to share? So we already know kind of that this year we're going to have roughly kind of tripled in revenue compared to last year. And we anticipate kind of that both revenue growth and team growth will continue in a similar trajectory into 2024 as well. Very good. Yeah. And then what are some of the, the biggest opportunities that you see for the future? 
So I would say kind of there's there's two levels. Yeah, one is kind of for us as a company, very specifically, we're constantly expanding our services portfolio. We started out with complex cell biology. We've since been moving into molecular biology, into biochemistry, including, for example, mechanistic enzymology, where we have a world class world class team in particular to then also encompass biophysics, structural biology, protein production, but there's still areas that we want to expand into. So we anticipate that over the next six to 12 months, there will be more areas we're going to bring online, including, for example, automated Admetox assays. At the same time, as a wider industry, one of the things I'm most excited about mm -hmm. is the continued drive towards having physiologically more relevant model systems which we make accessible to clients as well. So for example, moving from 2D cell culture to working on organoids, spheroids, core culture models, iPSCs, etc. So this is something which I believe for the industry as a whole is an important trend and something we also try to support as much as we can. Uh, definitely an, an exciting, uh, exciting time from that perspective as well. I mean, I know that we've had, uh, you know, in different, guests on that have talked about, um, you know, on a chip, you know, kind of technologies as well. And so, you know, for sure, that's, uh, that's definitely uh, an interesting aspect of where things are going. What do you see in terms of the future for things like machine learning and artificial intelligence. I touched on this. I, I did another podcast yesterday, uh, just, just before this one. And um, this kind of led to a similar conversation, but I'm just interesting, interested in knowing, you know, kind of what your perspective is in terms of, you know, what, what do you believe the future will be for machine learning and artificial intelligence and life sciences? Hmm. So I think over the past five to six years in particular, we've seen increasing adoption for AI and machine learning solutions within a drug discovery context. By now, we count several hundred companies that would be considered AI drug discovery in the wider sense of the word. One of the nice things about AI is, as an umbrella term, it encompasses many different techniques, many different approaches for many different use cases. You can find companies leveraging AI to, for example, read hundreds of thousands of scientific papers and generate new hypotheses for targets. You can find companies using AI in generative chemistry to come up with new designs for potential molecules. You can find companies using AI to read clinical information and understand which patients might benefit from a new therapeutic approach. So AI drug discovery really is an extremely broad term with many different companies falling under it. But what we're seeing is that more and more of these techniques find their way into routine applications. So the same way that 10 or 15 years ago, kind of a new approach would have been, it would have existed only kind of in a handful of biotech companies. It then permeates the entire industry. And we're seeing the exact same thing happening now with pharma companies building their own AI capabilities and AI teams with more and more partnerships between pharma and AI companies. So my personal prediction is that in a few years time, all drugs reaching the market will have had some form of AI involvement at some part of the journey. Some may be more, some may be less, but we're definitely entering an era where we start leveraging AI as the powerful tool that it is or that it can be. Okay, very good. And um, there are three questions that I like to ask every guest. What inspires you? Overall, what I've always been inspired by is to see the history of exploration. That can be scientific exploration, that can be geographic exploration, but people who are pushing the boundaries of what we know about the world and venture into the unknown and thereby make that accessible for others to follow. So seeing how, for example, scientific discoveries can then create entire industries, entire new fields. I mean, looking at, for example, CRISPR alone, one scientific discovery that now has so many applications across the life sciences, across medicine, across agriculture, et cetera. I think that is hugely fascinating. Very good. What concerns you? Overall, kind of what, what I always kind of find difficult to see is when an industry which is so, so much built on collaboration and on people working together to solve really tough challenges, like in our case, human health, then the last thing you want to see is these efforts being fragmented and these efforts being overshadowed by conflict. 
that can be conflicts such as, for example, between different geopolitical blocks, because we know that so many APIs are being manufactured in India, kind of foreign China. So one of the things that I would not want to see is human health being jeopardized even more so than now because of tensions that arise out of political questions. Yeah, I could definitely, um, definitely um, relate to that comment as well. Just, you know, given kind of the one, the one additional component, maybe the, just the levels of protection that you have to put in place to be able to protect what you're creating as well. um, Doesn't necessarily allow, you know, certain levels of collaboration either. And so you're kind of blocked, you know, from a, a perspective of protecting your intellectual property. And then you're also blocked, you know, kind of, you know, across even geographical boundaries as well. I completely agree. And you might have to take additional precautions, such as making sure that you bring important capabilities and important techniques back into, for example, the US kind of or Europe, which again, the ideal scenario would be that we can continue trading and continue leveraging what different countries and different regions have developed particular expertise in. But it also means that risk management, as you said, becomes a very central consideration for many companies. Yeah, absolutely. And the last question, what excites you? I think we're in a very exciting time in our industry. Because when we started out five years ago and spoke to the first potential clients, employees, investors about automating a broad range of drug discovery processes, people were mostly shaking their head and were just unsure why that would be necessary. And now five years down the line, the entire industry has completely changed its position. And we're seeing so many people who are actively requesting for integration of more technology, more automation technology into life sciences workflows, because they've recognized how critical it is that we deliver the best possible data quality, which we can then use for decision-making. So seeing how the entire industry has completely changed and been transformed within just a few years, And knowing that is only the beginning, knowing that in five years time, additional AI machine learning models, new microphysiological models and new techniques, which we don't yet even know about, will have a tremendous impact on drug discovery and then hopefully bringing more and better drugs to patients faster. That is something to be very excited about and to very much look forward to. Yeah, I agree with that. I, I I wonder both, I mean, it'd be interesting to know as well in terms of your perspective on this, in terms of the regulatory bodies, both in the U.S. as well as Europe, I mean, do you think that they'll, um, that they'll, you know, adopt just as quickly or do we, or will there be a lag and then kind of a, a bit of catch up in your, in your perspective? Hmm. I mean, I think we're already seeing some very exciting new legislation. I mean, for example, thinking very carefully which role animal models have to play in research or how much that might we might be in a position to substitute that with, again, more relevant in vitro model systems. So I think we're seeing there is definitely going to have a legislative push, I think, in the right direction. What most likely will happen is that throughout the next two or three years, companies will test out the limits as to how far can we actually go, how supportive our regulator is going to be in us submitting for example, a new application for a molecule to enter clinical trials, which has either no, only very limited in vivo data. So I think we will see that playing out throughout the next two or three years, but seeing that there is desire and a willingness across the different relevant players to make that change happen and to move away from animal models, that's already a very, very good position to be in. I completely agree. Well, Martin, Martin Emanuel Bittner, thank you so much for being on the Life Science Success Podcast. I greatly appreciate you being here. Thank you so much, Don. It was my pleasure. Thank you for listening to Life Science Success. For complete details about this podcast, including show notes, how to get in touch with guests, and more episodes, please visit www.lifesciencesuccess.com. If there's someone you'd like for us to invite to the show as a guest, please let me know by sending me a message at the podcast website. Please click subscribe on your favorite podcast app, share the podcast or tell a friend about it, and last but not least, rate the podcast. Thank you again. (music) 